What's up, former party people? This is Jerry, you know, the one who actually combs his hair on the A is for Alcoholic podcast. Now, if you're finding value in listening to the AIFA podcast every week and you want to support sharing it with others, we invite you to become a sustaining monthly or per show contributor. Go to patreon.com backslash AIFA. It's super easy and it only takes a quick moment. It's about as easy as buying one of those pre-cooked space chickens from the grocery store, taking it outside, giving it a big old kiss, and kicking it into traffic. (laughs) Why would you do that? Anyway, you do you, and I'll do me. Again, go to patreon.com backslash AIFA. And with that, people, let's start the show. A is for Alcoholic is a program about recovery. My name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. And my name is Jerry, and I'm an alcoholic. Join us as we go through the alphabet of alcoholism one letter at a time. Welcome back to the Ace for Alcoholic <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to this long I always, pause and silence yeah, here. I always try to do it all proper. Um, my name's John. I'm here with Jerry. You know us. You've, you've listened yeah. to us. You've, you've and done if it's this your first time, us. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome into the... The Verdant Halls of A's for Alcoholic. <laughs> this is a, a train train hobby enthusiast podcast. Right. Um, speaking of train hobby enthusiasts, our mutual friend, uh, Walter, put up his train, his Christmas train. You know, I don't know if you know this about him, but he has a little case, a Christmas case. No, I had, remember the train. It's coming back to me. Yeah. yeah, and he puts up the little tree in the train, and I don't know. This janky I, old little train. He's like, yeah, it's my Christmas train. Mm-hmm. I kind of remember this. White people are crazy, man. <laughs> that they are. Um, but he, uh, so he put up his train. Uh, you're not on Facebook, so you wouldn't see the. Uh, no, posts. there was a whole Facebook thing about it, huh? That's yeah. good. That's I know. Good. I know. I've been thinking because I've been feeling ill. So today I didn't really do anything. Well, that's not true. I went for a run. So that yeah, was I nice. saw that. I saw you out there. We ran the same amount. I ran five miles. Today. Nice. How'd it feel? Yeah. Good. Good. Cold? I'm not sore. Real cold. Started cold, ended nice. Yeah. Yeah, warmed up. Sun started coming out like halfway through it. About two and a half miles of sun came out, and I was like, oh, finally. It bought these gloves, and they're too thin. It really does. But I bought running. Well, I didn't buy running gloves. My wife got me running gloves for Christmas, but mm-hmm. they were way too thin, so my fingertips felt blue after a while, but... Eh, it was, it was, they warmed up. Everything was, it felt good. Well, I think the thing to remember is, um, is that if you're going to go running and it's cold out by the time, depending on how far you're going to go, it's going to be in yeah. a, another 15 degrees hotter. Like, so if it's like yeah. 52 degrees, like it's probably going to be like 75 when you yeah. get going. Oh man. I left the house. It was 38. Oh geez. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've done. Uh, I was almost 60 degrees here. I thought it, I was... No, nah, 38. Got home. It was like 40-something. It was just it's glorious. Oregon. Yeah. Nice, though. It was nice being out there. I had to... I did a selfie while I was running, like you do. Except you probably have a selfie stick. I was just holding the phone, and then I feel really self-conscious doing that. Like, someone's driving by, and they're like, that fucking idiot is filming himself running, you know? This yeah. so funny. Yeah. I... Well, I mean... I think I I think I feel that way sometimes too. I get self conscious about that fucking idiot on the phone, because I see right. people too. And whenever I see somebody on the phone doing something where they're supposed to be paying attention, I'm always like, pay attention. I mean, driving's a little bit different than running down the street. Yeah, absolutely. Running down, the, just stay on the sidewalk and try not to bash your head open if you right. crack, you know trip over a crack or whatever. But well, and but that yeah, was, no, it was good. Good, good. Yeah, I I could not believe when the sunshine came out, and I was like, oh, I can wear shorts for the first time this winter. I mean, I nice. live in California, so it's it's a little right. bit different. But um, yeah, it was just absolutely beautiful. Um, but I've been feeling under the weather and kind of just laying low in the house. And I took some Sudafed this morning, mm-hmm. and I took some Dayquil this afternoon. Oh shit, you're mixing them. And I I know, right? And I mean. I don't know how you feel about cold meds or anything like that. It's basically just, you know, ibuprofen and antihistamines. Right. But I take them if I need them, but I always yeah. feel like shit. I get, uh, like, NyQuil hangovers now, like I mm-hmm. did with booze. Not as bad as with booze, but I definitely feel hungover the next day, so I don't really mess with them unless I absolutely need them. 
Yeah. I, I never don't... took allergy meds though. Did you take allergy meds? When I lived in Oregon, when I lived in Eugene, I I had like some kind of thing. I had to get a prescription because it was so it was really I couldn't breathe. I like suffer through them because when I drank, I was always afraid that the allergy meds would would like interact with the alcohol. Mhm. And I was always drunk, so it was like <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I uh-huh. didn't want to be that dude that ended up taking like I don't know, not Sudafed, but the other ones, and like having to go to the hospital because I was all fucked up. I didn't take a lot of pills because I was drinking all the time, so I never under I never got into the wonder- wondrous world of like any of that stuff. But Claritin, like I never fucked. I've never even. T- I don't think I've ever taken a Claritin. I have some. I only need them for a couple of months in the summertime, mm-hmm. in the spring and summer. Well, my wife takes well, them, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah this is been two old men talking about allergies <laughs> and running it's like uh, no. right yeah <clears throat> i was thinking about you while i was running um the set because i waited till the afternoon it warmed up but i was thinking about like i was taking the the, the selfie right or i was taking the video and um i was kind of seeing i still have a little bit of this double chin and yeah. i was thinking about how we used to when we were drinking we would just we would joke about stuff like that we would joke about being chubby or being fat or having a double chin or you know, yeah. all these things that <laughs> we're both touching it while we're talking. We're both yeah, I know I'm like reach, reaching down because I still got a little bit of a um, I got a little flap here that I'm hoping I can yeah. tighten up. And I think that I will after if I get down another 15 pounds. Um, mm-hmm. But how it just used to be like the self-deprecating humor of alcoholism or that. It right. Is. I think it's important, like when you're making fun of something. If you're the butt of the joke, it's always much funnier, right? But yeah, I feel yeah. like it was definitely rooted in some sadness and self hatred and yeah. What I used to call it the whiskey. I said it was like my whiskey reserves or my whiskey barrel, or I'd <laughs> mm-hmm. be like, yeah, I got a fine collection of chins. I got a yeah. chin collection, but I never had like lots of double chins. I just had one big swollen. This whole area of my neck was like really, really bloated. And then when I stopped drinking, it went down, but it was still pretty big. But yeah, I can see the puffiness in heavy drinkers' faces that you can tell is not from overeating or bad diet. It's just from the alcohol, like just swelling everything out. You know, my mom used to always say, You look really bloated. You look engorged. Not engorged. That's my word. But she would say, You look really bloated. And I'd be like, You're fucking crazy. This is how I roll, lady. Mm-hmm. Look like a chicken dumpling right now. What are you talking about? I look good. And it's just, but it was always this thing of wanting to finding some way to accept it, finding some yeah. way to uh, to make it okay. You know, like and, yeah. and kind of just joke about it. And as long as you're funny, and I I could go on and you know I would love to um, discuss this with you further on another podcast about things like being overweight and body positivity and all kinds of stuff. Are you starting another podcast about body? Po- are we doing oh that? man, I don't know. I don't know that the... I feel like the conversations I want to have are, <sighs> man, it's, it's just, on the, it's... the P is the P is for podcast network. <laughs> it's seriously. It's well, I don't think that I, I think it's complicated and I think that it's, it's very much an individual person, but I see now right. people as me, as an alcoholic and somebody who lost a lot of weight in the last year, I see it in people and I know what it looks like to be unhealthy and I know what it looks like to be healthy. And I know from my own personal experience that how I'm feeling on the inside shows on the outside. Right. I mean, I would, I mean, I don't know if you would agree with that, but I see people now and I go like, man, I don't think that person is well. And it I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to pass judgment on anybody or anything like that. Or yeah, I really don't because I feel like being overweight, there's enough, there's enough shame in it already without having to be told or made to feel bad about something right. that you're having difficulty with. Well, you already emotionally feel, yeah, you're right. You feel emotionally and probably I imagine pretty physically shitty. I mean, mm-hmm. when, I, when I think of overweight, I think of like morbidly obese, which sucks because it's a strain on your body and it hurts but who am i to tell you shit i mean that's your path to take it's just like i don't go out there and fucking preach to the drunks you know Mm -hmm. it's funny because it actually this kind of bleeds into the subject of this why of this you can't touch this right 
You can't touch this. Yeah. Today's today's letter is why for you can't touch this. (laughs) But it bleeds really great into what we're talking about because my relationship with food can be very similar to my relationship with alcohol, if not the same. The only difference is I need the food to live, but I tend to overdo it with certain things because it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like struggle in my life right now, uh, especially over the holidays. Not necessarily with booze, because me and booze, that's kind of that, that, the, the booze is like, that button is like the fucking, that's it. That's like, I, I can't think of the word for it right now, but that's the button I press when I want to kill everything, you know? The ejector button, the, uh... Yeah, I guess, the, the alcohol suicide is like the, button, the, uh... the suicide button, you know, with alcohol. But with food, it's really easy for me to get into a pattern of eating a certain way, and I know what I'm capable of already, so I approach the way I eat the same way I approach my recovery, Except instead of abstinence, I'm just really aware of what I'm doing. So, like, my parents were just in town. They left yesterday morning. They flew out of Eugene at 9. We had to drive to the airport at 6. So I was like, yeah, we had to hustle Olive up. She she wanted to come with because she, like, loves her grandparents. So she wanted to roll and say bye to them and shit. But, like, the whole time they were here, you know, my mom made me a pecan pie. Mm -hmm. And I love pecan pie. But, like, a pecan pie, like, one slice is, like, fucking 400 calories. That's, like, a whole dinner. If you're yeah. good, you know, if you do it right. Um, so, like, yeah, I snacked on that. It was a lot of bread and pizza and stuff, but I enjoyed it. And But but there's always this thing where I'm always mentioning it because I'm afraid of relapsing back into a previous behavior. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, three days won't hurt you, Jerry, but the attitude you're giving yourself for those three days, I feel like, are setting a precedent. And I know overthink, and my mom's always like, oh, you think too much. Just enjoy yourself and don't worry about it. And I'm like, I can do that, but I just am worried about after you leave, whether or not whatever food is left over and whatever I'm dealing with, if I'm going to fall back into that. Because, I mean, when they left, I, I had gained like I – don't, I, don't, I didn't gain three pounds over the time that period they were here, <laughs> but I did great gain like three pounds, right? And so I have a set thing in my mind of this is where I'm supposed to sit. And so once I go outside of that – that area of where i'm supposed to be sitting weight wise it like fucks me up so like with booze i couldn't moderate i couldn't i can't do that you had to have absolute abstinence right because when i was drinking and i did try to moderate it was a really similar thing it was like i'm only allowed to drink four you know and like i never ever ever stuck with it ever Mm -hmm. i would try man i would drink four but then there's this thing in my brain that just would click it in and i just keep going man and and I think that's so common. It's not common. That's just what makes – that's our tapestry. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. And the fucked up thing that – you say that now and I try to think back to those moments where I said I'm just going to have four and then that thing in my brain clicks. But I was I was drunk at the time that it clicked so I can't even really process it or understand it fully on my right. own. And right. I certainly don't want to try to go back there, and I can't, I can't, I can't analyze it the way that I would want to, um, because I, I'm not going to drink, right? And it's just this thing that happens, and it takes over. And so many times we'd be out, I'd be out, and you know, I would always end up with this something at home alone, right? Whether it was it, sometimes it was booze, sometimes it was beer that I had there, sometimes it was cab take me to 7-eleven where i can get two bottles of like barefoot riesling and put it in the freezer Ooh, yeah really gross yeah shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um Excuse i think me. that abstinence i obviously well maybe not obviously i mean abstinence for me for you is is that's that's a deal breaker like no alcohol whatsoever i mean i wouldn't suggest <clears throat> my drinking in moderation if you're an alcoholic and this is one of those weird things where we we all self-diagnose it's almost like i can see how other people can say oh that's a cry for attention oh mm-hmm. you just this is just you're not really an alcoholic and then i'm like come drink with me and then i'll sh- let me show you my wonderful world you know what i mean like it's just like like the song at you know the willy wonka song mm-hmm you know? Yeah. Come and see. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's just me dancing with a half empty bottle of bourbon, be just crying. But then that, like, that boat ride at right. the end, at the end of the tunnel. That's pretty much all of it is that boat mm-hmm. ride, just the chicken's head getting cut off over and over. Right. I guess my point is um, if if you're an alcoholic, I would never recommend moderation. I Do would you... recommend abstinence. I would. And I don't say mm-hmm. a lot of absolutes, but I honestly think if you if you drink the way I drink, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say try it in moderation because it'll fuck you up. 
This is just, I guess it's hard for me to make that statement on a podcast. I, I it's just weird for me to be like, hey, you're an alcoholic. You can try it in moderation. You know that, like, I've never, I have never really seen it work with other people. I would love to talk to somebody. I would love, and I, I would put this as an open invitation to somebody who has struggled with alcohol in the past and who feels like they have created some sort of system of moderation. Now, right, because there's here's, a spectrum. Here, here, there's a right. spectrum. Yeah, because I feel like you know we we try to promote sobriety and we promote recovery and we promote feeling better and we 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 discuss our own issues and struggles and and a lot of the pain and suffering and you know ours is not the same as somebody else's and i right, i right. talked to a guy the other day and he said you know I, I love aa and i've been there and they've asked me to speak but i'm not a part of that i just kind of quit on my own i had some friends that helped me i had a support group and you know i feel great and it's been however many years and he doesn't drink at all he do, he's absolutely you know sober but he doesn't require nor is he interested in going to AA meetings. He was super supportive of it and he said it's a great resource and all this other stuff. But like to him it was just not necessary. So there's right. definitely this spectrum and I would be curious to sit down and, and listen to somebody tell me about um, their moderation. And not that I yeah, necessarily want to yeah. promote that, but I, I feel like it should it's only fair to have that discussion and to, you know, so if anybody out there is listening that thinks they have unlocked the key um, I would love for you to come on the show and talk about it. I think um, I'd prefer it if you weren't drinking at the time, but <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Don't hit us up all <laughs> drunk. Um, and then I was thinking, do you think like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory could kind of be a metaphor for alcoholism and recovery? Because it could. I mean, we have to give it a, another watch through. But yeah, because I think if you start with all the childhood trauma. You know, and the excitement of the that. <laughs> and the excitement of the golden ticket from a young age right. is, uh -huh. you know, you find this thing that will help you escape the doldrums and sadness of your of your life, right. and then right. you go through this wild, crazy ride, and it has its ups and downs, and you're, you know, they're sip the little thing and a little hiccup, and they go up, and and then right. he finally says, you I know don't what? Know, though, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm maybe I'm maybe it's a stretch. Yeah, because no one ever gave me a candy factory at the end of a fucking blackout. You know what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no well, one was ever like, here you go, Jerry, here's a multi-million dollar business because you blacked out super good last night. Well, maybe because he gave back the gobstopper, that was his way of releasing his alcoholism or his resentment. Yeah, but he's still going to go back to eating candy and shit That's true. once he gets to the factory. I forgot how that fucking movie ended, but yeah. I think they give him the factory. Willy Wonka's like, yo, I'm out, deuces, this factory mm -hmm. sucks, I want to go do wild shit. Here you yeah. go, Charlie, and Charlie's like, fuck yeah, and then it's like... Ooh, bow, bow, chicka, chicka. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, what was it? Was it Ferris Bueller? Bueller's day, day, bow, off? bow, dude. Yeah. yeah. Day, bow, bow. Um, but, uh, I don't know, man. It's different. It's a, definitely a spectrum. I, I got a lot of gems from my dad over the past four days. You know, he and I talked a lot about it and it's, we talk about, you're talking about, uh, child, childhood trauma, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, cause we were talking about people, instances of relapse. And I was wondering what and I'd also love to talk to a person who who has relapsed you know who's got a few years under their belt and went back out I'm very curious about that because I wonder what path that that you go down to that that that's the end of that path you know is, is going back out again he but he, it's just funny that you mentioned childhood trauma because that was one that he had mentioned it being these four psychological you're either genetically dispositioned which is a certain percentage of people are genetically just dispositioned to it then there's another you know, percentage of people who have childhood trauma or some type of trauma. Then there's another group of people who were just having a really good time and it just got out of their hands. You know, it's all these different people with these addiction issues, you know. Because you could be, I mean, I don't, I guess even with alcohol, you could be not genetically dispositioned to be an alcoholic, but just binge drink all through college and the next thing you know, you're physically hooked in it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It just becomes this pattern of behavior, physical pattern of behavior, and then an emotional path that follows it, you know? I think I had all three. <laughs> yeah, I probably <laughs> did know, too. And I was looking at him going like, yeah, I had all that shit. So mm -hmm. I don't know, you know? Um, But I, I, what's the other thing, you know, your dad said about, 
if you get a little recovery in you or a little AA, it'll ruin your drinking. Like it. Yeah, yeah, he said that to me. He said that to me a couple times, and I've heard it in the meetings too. Just Be- you, because. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just gonna say because I, I, I don't often think, but I think about like relapse, and I think about having another drink, and I think about knowing all. I was thinking about this this afternoon, knowing all the stuff I know now, and then if I were to have that first drink, I don't think. Either I would slip back into it so quickly and be done, like done, done, or I would just, I would have those first couple of drinks and be like, fuck, I fucked up, and I would just have to start all over, but I, I just don't think that I could enjoy it. I would have to do it, it would have to be out of some serious, like, self-harm and loathing. I think I'd have to convince I think we'd both have to convince ourselves that these last few years of things being positive were bullshit. Right. You know, or that we were we were big enough and strong enough to be able to to, to do both, to drink and maintain the lives that we've been living right now. Cuz there's alcohol there's no room in it right now for for what I have going on in my life. It just doesn't fit in the boat. How so could I you? I, I mean, what you, the, as because much Because then I put all of it in the boat. <laughs> you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like we we're going on a fishing trip and I was like, "Bring some beer." Oh, it doesn't fit in the boat because I want to bring fucking 1230 packs it's just gonna sink the boat you know these fucking nautical metaphors again but yeah yeah. no there's you're right there's no room in the boat not if i not if i want to have my good job and my relationship that's got to go in the boat saving money's got to go in the boat getting up early has got to go in the boat running's got to go in the boat all the things that are making you feel good that in a fundamental like permanent way of feeling good Mm -hmm. not permanent but do you know what i mean in a long lasting Mm -hmm. um a way of feeling good that has longevity and legs on it, you know, all that shit's got to go because that alcohol is going to take the center center stage. Because I don't know about you, but for me personally, when I drank almost to the near to the end, I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew I was drinking alcoholically, but I still lied to myself and said I was just a heavy drinker. I was, I just drank really heavily. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably an alcoholic, most definitely an alcoholic, but I'm not like one of those alcoholics. I'm one of these like fun, heavy drinkers. This is a part of my character. This is who I am as a person. You know, we we're putting Christmas ornaments up, you know, a few weeks ago. And like my mom bought me this little sock monkey mm-hmm. ornament that had a little lampshade on its head and a martini glass, you know, and I hung <laughs> the ornament up still. And I was like, wow, like, and then I thought about it, like how many Christmas presents were flasks? Like I got a bunch of flasks and shit and like stuff I got like cocktail books and stuff because that's what i did so and i was talking to my dad about it and he's like yeah well that's what you did so that's what we got you because that's what you were into that's who you were mm-hmm. and i realized like this this character this that i thought was i accentuated my character and gave me depth was more of a uh a, 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 a defect you know i mean i i'm trying to think of another word other than character defect but i mean i don't know man a lack of character it's you you replace I would replace it was a personality trait. It was something right. that I was known for. It was right. something that we we were we were both known like, uh oh, here comes trouble or right. you know, oh hey, These the party guys, showed yeah. up. Or right. you know, they're gonna say some wild shit and they're gonna have fun and be a little bit louder and you know, everyone's gonna have a good time for, you know, maybe the first little while, but then at, at a certain point it's like, you guys gotta go home. Yeah, the wagon ride gets a little too <laughs> bumpy, you know, like starts off great and then we lose a wheel you know mm-hmm. like yeah it's absolutely true and i yeah but i i just i can't ever see it being a part of my life again and i i because i'm already you know there's other things that i want to achieve now and i actually look at the the future as something to look forward to right you right. know and when i was drunk it was always in this sort of haze of there was a certain, um, it was like living in the moment, but it was every hellish negative moment, you know? It was not a being present. It was just, it was more just reacting like an amoeba to stimuli, whether it be sunlight or vodka or you right. know, fighting or whatever the alarm, you, you know? I was just constantly having to react rather than, than to be proactive about anything. Right. And it was right. a really terrible way to live. That's a great way of putting it. Like constantly having to react instead of being proactive. So instead mm. of 
Do you know what I mean? Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. It's always like, yes, a reflex instead of being, yeah, it's, it's great. It's a great way of thinking about it. But I think, uh, for on my end, like I have to just always be aware that it, even though I have no room for it, it's sneaky as fuck, right? They get cunning, ban- cunning, baffling, and powerful. It is sneaky as fuck, and that's why I had brought up relapse because I know people. I've heard of people and met people who have had seven years, eight years, more time, way more time than me, and they go back out. I know a man who, I know a man who had like twenty some, almost thirty, about thirty some years or so, and he's back out again. He's not drinking as alcoholic. At least he's not portraying himself as drinking as alcoholically as before but there's something Mm -hmm. back there i mean if you're clean and in a program for 30 years you know and then you go back out again because you're like well i just want to have a piece of i want to you know a beer a pint of beer of my pizza you know like i don't know man i don't know i'd have to experience it for myself to know it and i don't want to because i've got shit to do and like earlier i was saying my stomach was bugging me and now i feel fine but if I were drinking, man, this would not be happening. I'd be still back there doing doing whatever I got to do to deal with my gut, you know, because my gut would be full of fucking booze, have yeah. a hole in it, you know? Yeah. It was, and I, I remember, that was one of those, one of the first things, and I still remember this, like, we're talking four and a half years ago, which I can't believe it's been that long. Like, I'm really... Yeah, it feels like a long time. You know? And, um, but I still remember those first several months of shaky sobriety and that I guess maybe yeah. that first year and what the, all the stuff that was really cool to me was the physical stuff like oh I don't feel like you know I'm gonna have the shits all the time I'm not always right. hung over I have money in the bank and all these things it's like oh wow this is really cool and I couldn't imagine having to contend with any of those things right now because it would just be such a hindrance on my day you know yeah Mm -hmm. Um, and oh, so before I, I forgot, I wanted to mention something about last week. So last week there was a, I sent you a picture. It was a picture of a tweet or something like that of these girls in Australia and I didn't have the name. So the name I wanted to give a shout out to, um, I think it's Tosh and Caitlin and their, um, the name of their podcast is why am I like this? And I, unfortunately I haven't listened to all of it or all of them I should say there's quite a few and I'm doing my best but um but I guess one of them is an alcoholic and the other one isn't but and they they so they just talk about mental disorder and um and alcoholism and they were very kind to uh, to talk about us as their sober uncles yeah <laughs> or something like that so I'm totally a sober uncle I just found <clears throat> a, a lollipop in my wife's purse nice yeah you know, like a regular television. This is my house. treat for the day. Pew, pew, oh, pew, pew. No pecan pie. But um, yeah. No, I had, to, I had a pecan pie for lunch. Mm. But I just Not wanted to lunch, say what I up had to them. Slipper. But yeah, what up to them? I'm sorry. It's, if you hear clicking noises, it's me enjoying <laughs> a Christmas lollipop. I'll try not to eat too loud during the podcast. Um, but That's I think rad. It's, we got listeners in Australia. I know. That's, and it's I, 2019. I, Thank you, SteveJobs.com. Seriously, SteveJobs.com. Yeah. Uh huh. And if there's anybody out there in Australia, or um, I see sometimes we have listeners in Japan, I see that we sometimes have listeners in Germany, in Ireland, um, I would love to hear about your experiences out there in the world and how you found this podcast. So, I mean, we have a few international listeners, so I would please send us an email. We love input. I really, really really do. do. We want you to get involved because if not, it's just us two talking for another fucking <laughs> <Right>? year. <laughs> and then eventually it'll stop you about booze and just being like, so how much you run today? Mm-hmm. You like those new toe shoes or whatever we're fucking mm-hmm. doing? Well, I'm curious about the little the little toe shoes. Uh, they're supposed to be good for your for your feet because like the ones <laughs> – see, it's it's already happening. I can't help <laughs> it. I'm just <laughs> nodding right at you like, no, man. Uh, anyhow, uh, I just – I like the minimalist shoes. That's all. But – I think that, um, yeah, I can't, I can't ever imagine a moment of going, you know what, a drink is going to be what solves this, or a drink is going to make it better. But you also had to remain on top of it, because I imagine your mind will trick you, though. That's the bitch of it, right? They're always like, your brain will trick you. Mm-hmm. Your brain will fucking trick you. That thing in your head that regulates all the shit you do, it wants you to fucking go out there and get wild. It, it will fucking trick you. Now... Some would say that that's that's a bit of some 
brainwashing by this particular mm-hmm. program that we mm-hmm. subscribe to and they'd say you know you that's not not everybody's has that problem in that way and you know like that and so yeah. i i will say this that my brain has tricked me in many ways not just alcoholically and that's why this particular program makes sense to me it's not just the alcohol or the food um but the relationships and jobs and money and health and all of it my brain has yeah, constantly dude. been you know and our our brains are built to find comfort right and to seek pleasure and all that kind of stuff but my brain has been tricking me for years and so there's no reason for me to think that it would not do otherwise unless trained and maintained right Right. And so, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it being a brainwash or a, a, a cult or... Uh, it's definitely not a cult, I don't think. Once again, the old joke, because people in cults do what you tell them to do. <laughs> I think there is some brainwashing. I think there can be some stuff in it. I was having a conversation with my dad about this, too. and We talked about it quite a bit, and he's worked within the program as well, and it's helped him out. It's pretty much the cornerstone of his whole life philosophy it comes off this program, you know? Mm-hmm. But even he was like, yeah, they should, there should be stuff about it that should change, though, you know? And I agree with him. I feel like some of the literature needs to change a little bit or, you know, be rewritten or rethought of or this just this way of approaching it. Because it works. It really, really works. But, you know, I also know within the rooms, they're like, no, nah, no, nah, you don't fuck with any of that shit. That's heresy. Like you leave it the way it is, you know. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, man. I, 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 I don't. I, there's an element of brainwashing to it, and I can see it. You know, like the uh, there's a lot of aspects to it that made me feel really hanky at first that I just do now, just but, for the sake of doing it. You know, because but, because why? Because they make you feel better now, or some of it makes me feel better, but some of it I just go along with just because. I'm not gonna be the one dude that who's doesn't stand up at the end and hold hands and say the little fucking incantation. Do you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I'm not gonna sit there yeah. with my arms crossed and be like, "Fuck all y'all," you know, like, mm-hmm. dude, because I'm not rude. I'm well, just gonna do it and then go sit in my car and be like, you know what? Part of me believes that, and part of me feels that union there where it feels good. If it feels good to me, and it's not fucking my day up. I'm not gonna go home and hold hands with my wife and make her say some little prayer with me. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? But there's part of me too, like the skeptic in me is like, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, I, dude. you say skeptic. And I think also when, when I was drinking and I think when you were drinking, you know, being cynical was another part of my personality trait, your personality, you know, you, yeah. you, yes. you yes. proclaimed yourself a cynic in more ways than one, you know? And um, I feel like in recovery, in sobriety, in all the shit that's happened in the last four and a half years, cynicism doesn't really serve me very well in in furthering this stuff, like being cynical about about anything. You know, yeah. that's why I get really gets under my skin about like when people want to talk about conspiracy theories and shit like that. And I'm just like, I don't want that in my head because it doesn't really serve me to a higher purpose you know correct correct and so would you i mean would you say that you you've become obviously well maybe not obviously but less cynical in the last five years or no yeah yes and no (laughs) there are elements of me that are still skeptical and i'm a very contrary person like i just can't Mm -hmm. help it i don't want to do what everybody else around me is doing i don't want to do it but i want to find another way of doing it that's the problem it's not that I don't want to do it just because I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it because I'm tired of it. I want. I know there's other ways to do it, and we should do it the other way. So there's that. There's a cynicism. I think there's a still a little bit of cynicism, but there's way more optimism and way more hope than mm-hmm. there ever was. Where the cynicism was my loss of hope and my lack of hope, you know. But there's still that cynicism like... Ah, there's just some things I can't fucking change, so what's the use in getting all fucked off about it, you know? It's just like, and we don't really discuss politics very much, and I won't get too deep into it, but like, there's some other podcasts I listen to 
it's a great podcast. And then the minute they get into the political aspect of it, even though I agree with them, absolutely 100%, I have to turn it off sometimes because it feels so fucking hopeless that there's nothing I can do to change it. So why sit there and focus on it and be pissed off about it? It's a, it's a thing I cannot change. So I have to accept it. And my way of accepting it is just not, it's walking away from it. You know what I mean? I don't mm-hmm. have to listen to it and feel that panicky feeling of being trapped and trying to get out. So a lot of, you know, a lot of that has to do with political stuff with me. So I, I just, I'm not willfully trying to be ignorant of it. I just, it just makes my fucking heart hurt and it makes my chest hurt and there's nothing I can do about it. So I, I there's where my cynicism ends. The conspiracy theory stuff started off cute in the 90s and turned into weird white supremacy shit. And I'm like, nah, I ain't fucking with that either. That's that's my hot take for 2019. <laughs> yeah, right. But then, like, you got the guys at the shop, right? They all love Star Wars. They all love The Mandalorian. Like, I don't fuck with that shit. I won't. I won't watch it. Why? Because they're all watching it. That's why. That's the base simple rules. It's this contrary nature. They're like, you're missing out on a good show and you're doing it just to be anti. And I'm like, there are plenty of other good shows that I watch that are great. That I don't have to sit around and masturbate with the rest of you guys over it. We don't all have to rub dicks over the Mandalorian, dude. You guys know it's great. That's great. Hot, hot yeah. high five to you, man. This is we should have Jerry Wagner hot takes corner. <laughs> I'll do just a, like, I'll do I don't like takes. the way the government's run. I don't like Star Wars. What about Baby Eddie Murphy Yoda? Saturday Night Live? Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda's cute as fuck, dude. If <laughs> if you would give me a movie with just Baby Yoda and um that German asshole, at, Werner Herzog. Uh, Werner Herzog, yeah, and he's just like bring the Yoda to me. <laughs> me and Yoda writing fucking deep. I feel like there's a. I, I don't fucks know. with Baby Yoda, you know, like I would watch that mm-hmm. if it were in the Star Wars universe, though. If it was just a just uh, Werner Herzog on a Muppet show with with a Baby Yoda. Mm-hmm. Interesting, mm-hmm. interesting. Baby, baby, uh, I would pay even more money to see a Baby Coda. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, he's a he's a friend. The, of I know we got to explain ours, it. But... I was texting him last night, and I was just like, man, I see a little wiry little Coda just smoking tiny big black eyes <laughs> big green ears anyway so I, there are aspects of my life that i'm still very cynical and contrary mm-hmm. about because i don't buy some of that shit but when it comes to my recovery there's not a lot i'm cynical about because to me this to me the mandalorian's not life or death but to me recovery is to me still it's still my life or my death you know not even my physical death but the death of my character the death of my happiness the death of my joy the death of my hope you know, so there is no Star Wars New Hope for me if I'm fucking crushing fucking fists old crow. You know, there's no hope. It's just I hope I don't fucking die tonight. And that's something <laughs> I've so no. And this is this is this is really profound for those people who don't know you. I knew you when you were drinking, and you you didn't give a shit about yourself in a lot of ways. No, no. Mm-mm. And I remember nights drunk sad crying you know i and and you know we when we lived together in a couple different was it just the one place we just lived together in the one place no you stay with me in my apartment a couple times that's right no i think we just lived together on the dirty 30 yeah on 30th Um, university yeah but there was a lot of those nights where i remember and i was the same way I, i don't you know but for you to say i don't give a shit about myself or i i I would want to kill myself or I'd rather die or just I would rather this be over and all that stuff to say now that you take it absolutely seriously is yeah. is hugely profound to me from just from the outside. Looking right. Up. Right. So um, we'll, we'll keep coming back, Johnny. It works. <laughs> so I mean, and, you know, when you talk about like holding hands and saying the prayer and I don't really know what the prayer means. And I think I've memorized most of it since I've said it enough times, the what the daily bread business Give us right. this day. Oh, but you guys do the Lord's. The, it the, changes the, up. Sometimes it's sometimes something. Well, I was raised and, Catholic, so I knew all the, the yeah. Catholic ones. But there I like the Serenity Prayer personally. Yeah, I do. I love the Serenity Prayer. It's all about acceptance, dude. And I fucking, mm-hmm. I'm down with that. I'll fuck with that. I'll try to. But I, I just feel like all I'm doing is taking a moment. It doesn't matter what I said. I could be saying the the, the Baby Yoda prayer. Whatever right. that your, is, you know, your like, grocery list. Yeah, exactly. Your shopping list. So that's it's not so important as far as what the words are, but that I'm saying something in unison, unison, you know, or with a group of people, 
that are like-minded. And so I think there's right. a certain level of harmony that comes with it. And so I can appreciate that. And that's a great way to leave a meeting. And I think more meetings should be like that just in general, if there was some level of harmony and connectedness. Right. Like and... at a city council, they just finished with the hokey pokey or some shit. Something. You know, like, yeah. You know what I mean? Because I, I love to feel good when I leave, you know? And so I don't know. I've certainly, maybe, maybe I'm not, I, maybe I wasn't as cynical as you, but I certainly, <laughs> I've lost a lot of it and I feel much more hopeful and much, you know, more excited. Right. I'll, I'll say this quote again, and this is from, um, this is Chuck Palahniuk in Invisible Monsters, and I, I kind of flipped it, but, you know, he says he's throwing postcards off the Space Needle. Do uh-huh. you remember this book? Yeah, I remember the book, but I don't remember that part of the book. Well, they're, they're like writing notes on this postcard. They're just writing things, just sayings or whatever they can think of, and they're throwing them off the Space Needle. And one of them is says, he says, when did, the, when did the future go from being a promise to a threat? And right. I always thought That's that was great. really cool. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. then in recovery, I flipped it around because it, it was like the, the future's gone from being a threat to being a promise. Bum, that there's bum, something. Bum. Chuck would be mad. I probably. Although, be do like, you think. Don't you, I don't know, man. A whole fi- the whole beginning of Fight Club is about how the only way he can get sleep is by going to 12 step meetings. Mm-hmm. Ah, shit. And he's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's an exhaustive researcher. Chuck Palahniuk really is. is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would be curious to know what he thinks. And I don't know that he is has any substance abuse problems. You know, I don't know. I got a little tidbit about Chuck Palahniuk. Go. I love Chuck Palahniuk because he went on Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan interviewed him. And he like shook fucking Joe Rogan and I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Because say what you will about Joe Rogan, he is a, a very curious, introspective person. He's kind of, I don't agree with him on like a lot of shit. Mm-hmm. He kind of was my gateway to podcasts, but I just love that he shook, kind of shook fucking Joe. Like he got up to pee, and Joe was telling his like sound guy, like that he's a weird dude, man. He's kind of a weird dude, and I love that because what he was saying to me didn't sound weird at all. I was like, this is very interesting. Tell mm-hmm. me more. You know, it wasn't some, it wasn't you know some fucking MMA dude or or Joey Diaz or. Anyhow, I just love that he shook Joe. I love it. Yeah. That was a great fucking It really pod was. Too. I remember yeah, it was that. It a great too. interview, yeah. Um, but Chuck, I, I wonder about Chuck. And, I mean, he, he had the whole idea of 12 step meetings pretty accurate, you know, for the most part. Mm hmm. I think so. Yeah. I think the most yeah. accurate of anything I've seen him portrayed in movies and TV. Yeah. Did you read A Million Little Pieces, that James Fry book? No, so that... that I read it, but I was fucking loaded the whole time I read it, so I forgot it all. You Well, I think you remember telling me the end of it where he's like sitting with a pint of whiskey or something like that. Mm -hmm. But didn't that end up... So what's the full story behind that story? He wrote this fantastical book about meeting this gangster in rehab and becoming best friends with him and getting on an airplane with two holes in his face, bleeding everywhere in a blackout, and then dropping him in rehab and... How they gave him a, a, what do you call it, root canal, and he refused drugs because he's sober now, and he had, like, squeezed tennis balls, and it was all bullshit. He, like, went on Oprah and was like, yeah, I did all this shit. And then later on, these people from the rehab facility were like, he was never here. You know what I mean? And people on the plane were like, he was never on the plane. So he was just some lying-ass dude. Maybe he's, I don't know, hopefully he's contented with being a lying ass dude but it made him a shitload of money Uh, there's my cynicism yeah there is my cynicism in that because sometimes i will look at my daughter and be like people can be shit sometimes like i'll say that to a nine-year-old i'm like sometimes people are shitty not all the time but sometimes people will give in to their fucking base nature because that's that's just what they do so just be cautious of them yes you know yeah stick with the cool people yes you know Whose base nature is to be kind and generous and in harmony with the world and all that shit, you know? I just happen to find them in, you know, church basements these days, among other places. That's not the only place. I hope but... she goes the other place. I'd hate for my kid to have to go to fucking <laughs> AA. That would suck, dude. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's just the But little... if she does, I'll be like, hey, I'll help you out. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. But one of the things that was... So when you talk about people are shitty, one of the things that was really pivotal in my recovery in the beginning was my sponsor telling me he's like you're gonna have to trust me because i Mm -hmm. didn't i didn't trust him at all Mm -hmm. i didn't want to trust him i didn't want to trust and i didn't realize how little trust i had in anybody else like and how now i go well i think everything's gonna work out okay like i'll get frazzled by a 
by a schedule mishap or something like that or whatever. And now I'm just like, I think everything's going to work out. I think it's going to be fine. And um, but I didn't I was so untrusting. And so I think that that's that's a huge part of recovery for me was being able to kind of that let go. And you trust. called me up and you're like, this guy said I have to read him my fist step or he won't sponsor me. Just how does that work out in the rules? I'm like, well, typically that's what you're supposed to do. I'm like, you don't have to do it with him. I mean, you could go find like a rando other alcoholic, but it's probably your best bet to do it with him since he wants will to be help working together. Yeah. He wants to help. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm like, listen, man, you can do what you want to do. But I mean, I think it's typically how it works is if you're going to be doing step work with someone, you got to do one of this. You don't have to. Right. But it'd be, it'd be a lot easier than just, I mean, who would you go read it to anyway? Like a Buddhist monk on the bus or something? And it's a long just talking bus about ride. stealing and lying and shit? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember asking you about that. Like, I kept thinking, like, you know, what am I supposed to do? I, and I think I was trying to find some way out of actually doing them, doing any of the, the work toward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all I was looking for was some sort of. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Oh, you know, I wanted to, I had a piece of, um, mail that I wanted to share with you. And, um, you know, you said you went running and I went running this afternoon and this come, this comes from a guy named Ben. Um, I don't know why I'm so weird about, I don't want to give people's last names, but you know, yeah, whatever. Um, they, they send me emails, but. So Ben says, Just hey, do guys, first name, last initial. But anyway, go ahead. Ben R. Um, there you go. Hey, guys, love the podcast. Started listening when I got sober back in February. Hearing you guys talk every week gave me a lot of help when I started my journey. And I look forward to the new episodes every week. Keep up the great huh. work. Also, I'm a big runner and I love it when John talks about running. I think that's why I like this. <laughs> <laughs> I've attached a picture of my rack of medals from races from from the last 10 years keeping up my exercise was crucial was a crucial outlet for me when i first got sober i was so happy to hear about your recent half marathon because i know what it takes to train for one and what a great accomplishment it is to finish talk about it with pride my dude anyway i have no idea why i felt like sharing this with you other than to let you know that your podcast played a big part in my early sobriety and i almost felt feel like i know you guys personally now ben Thank you very much. And he sent me this picture. It's, I don't know if you can see that, but. Damn, that's a shitload of medals. Damn, that's a shitload of medals. That's like I a know. metal cubby. That's like a cubby yeah. made from medals. Thank you for the email, Ben R. That's rad. So. Um, that really is rad. That, I don't mean that insincerely. Like, yeah, yeah, good job. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> no, but for real, like, that's. I love hearing shit like that. That's why I want more emails. Maybe that's my new fucking addiction is just knowing that I help people. God, that sounds corny as fuck, though. My addiction is helping. <laughs> hey. I feel like, dude, I feel like, get the fuck out of my house, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, it, but it's, it's, it's always, it's a great reminder whenever I'm, whenever I think that we're just talking into the void. Because I appreciate doing this with you and, you know, it's, it, it certainly helps me organize yeah. my thoughts for the week and you know when i always come across i come back with something new or something different or like oh yeah wow i never thought about it that way jerry that's awesome so ah. you know but i i always appreciate when i hear from people and so that's why i would just say if you can if you got something to say there's plenty of ways to reach out to us wherever um but it's a uh i just i i'm glad that that what we're saying is making some sense to people and yeah me too me too and I, I really am and not that i want to promote or tell anybody what to do but this is just seems to be what's worked for me and but we'll have t-shirts on sale soon at the <laughs> right? I mean, for alcoholic <laughs> web store uh, I mean, we won't we won't have t-shirts Thanks again for listening. Our music, as always, is by Neglect. You can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com. And you can find us on all social media platforms that matter, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us at aisforalcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs>